uh, introduction is just uh, could you please tell us a bit about yourself and how you're going to web development? Let's start with Zell. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Zell. I got into web development about four, three, I uh, can't remember, three to four years ago, maybe. So when I got into web development, there was a point in time I was learning design. So at that time, I was just learning and then I'm like, uh, okay, I learned about all these things and then it's not going to be used anyway because I can't put it up there for anyone to see. So then I was like, man, mm, okay, I need to do something like make a website kind of stuff. So I created a, so that's when I started like front end stuff. And then after I went in there, it just started nonstop. So I went, after that, I went to WordPress, create my own blog, and then went more front end stuff, freelance front end stuff, and front end stuff, and front end stuff. That was basically a very short version, yes. Well, one, one thing I realized, I'm pretty sure all three of you, and in fact myself included, we don't have uh, actually formal <laughs> education in web development, do we? No, I don't. Um, no, I don't. There was no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> there were no computers in my school. <laughs> also, anybody is worrying about the state of education, don't worry. Like, okay, what did you study in school? I studied business. Yeah. 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 So apparently Chris studied business too, so yeah. tell us about I also yourself. have a worthless degree. <laughs> tell, yeah. tell us about yourself. Um, I jumped on the internet in 94 because it looked interesting. Um, and some of my friends were talking about these chat rooms that sounded so like, well, that's nice. And then there was this web thing. Um, a couple of years later, I got my first uh, internet <coughs> account to get access at home. It wasn't through a 14 4 modem to university. And I thought, these web pages look interesting. Maybe I'll make one of my own. Um, and I did. And it wasn't that hard. And then JavaScript got introduced. And I learned, it was like, well, you can script things now. And then we had to use inline text and stuff. That's how I got started. That, I was studying at university somewhere along the line. Ended up with a degree that's worth nothing. Um, I should say I'm an engineering manager now. So I've got the manager in my role, which kind of helps. Um, graduated university, realized I was qualified to do nothing. Um, ended up in sales very briefly, and I absolutely hate sales, so I managed to get fired. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's talk about that later. <laughs> I took a step down from being fired and ended up in tech support, and hated that. Got paid minimum wage, which was terrible. Managed to fight my way out of that and use my web development skills that I've been building up on the side and. Um, Studying in the industry that way. The only reason I managed to do that was um, there were games that I liked, like Red Alert was popular in the 90s, uh, a couple of bands who I helped with their sites. Uh, for some reason, I learned SQL along the way. I don't even know how. Um, <coughs> so, based on that, I got a job as a developer and um, yeah, somehow ended up in Singapore. <laughs> it's probably stuff in, in, the, in between, but I don't know. Where are we from originally? From uh, Australia. Australia. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm out of there now, it's alright. I can say worse things about Australia than anyone else can. <laughs> we can go there later. Um, how about you, Richard? Uh, well, I, so yeah, I'm really old. I have been doing this stuff since about 96. I'm actually a trained dancer. My, so I left school at 16 to study dance and went to work with, was working in the theatre, eventually working backstage in the theatre and uh, got pregnant with my daughter. And that doesn't work well with working in the theatre, <laughs> like being pregnant. Or, in fact, I was like one of two women working backstage in the West End or in a heavy crew role at the time. And when I told my boss that I was pregnant, he looked at me like, you mean you're a woman? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was five months pregnant, still climbing ladders, and they're like, no, I don't think you should be doing this. So I ended up, uh, I got a computer because a chap at uh, PC World uh, sold me a computer rather than a word processor, which is what I wanted, because I thought I'd be able to do some <laughs> typing. 
Um, so I got onto the internet and uh, yeah, taught myself the same really, wanted to put up a web page, this was interesting, learned HTML which took like about an afternoon. Because uh, there wasn't very much to learn, not that I'm super clever. Did you use a particular tutor tutorial that you um, found? There or? were tutorials that my, service, my ISP had some HTML okay. tutorials, and that's where I started learning it. Um, and then very quickly taught myself Perl. And the reason I taught myself Perl was I wanted to write a guest book for my website. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how this ended up with me going from, I'd like to put a guest book on my website, to I'm going to learn Perl. But I was a baby, and I was bored. So... <laughs> So I'm learning Perl from the Camel books, if anyone, no one knows Perl. Um, but having learned Perl, I could pretty much learn anything I wanted, because Perl's okay. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was really how it started, and by the time I kind of needed to get like a real job rather than take on bits of freelance stuff, it was 2000 and middle of the sort of dot-com time in, in the UK. Um, and I managed to get a job heading up a technical team um, with these sort of cobbled together Linux admin skills I had from installing Perl on terrible machines. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so that was really where it started, and I've been doing it ever since. So it kind of works out right, considering I've got no skills. <laughs> <laughs> no practical skills. Mm. There seems to be a common theme <laughs> in terms of self deprecation while I'm doing here. I was always surprised that anything happened. It's like, what, what am I doing here? You know, still. Yeah, that's the strangest thing though is because people will ask you like, how did you end up where you are I've got no idea likewise. there is no path that I can give you that you can follow that would end up here <laughs> like, likewise I have no idea how I ended up freelancing in 10 months don't you guys feel reassured now like, no. No. you go boost everybody um, but one thing all three of them have in common is they all speak at conferences so let's talk about that so <laughs> how and why did you start school? what <laughs> I only started speaking last year, so like super inexperience when it comes to conferences. So far, um, last year at CSS conference was my first one. Then I had uh, one online conference with CSS submit. No, sorry, responsive web design, I think, but with with um, Chris Smith. Then Amsterdam for Frontiers, and then well, nothing this year because I ended up like. Mistaking the dates for CSN Conf, I thought I would be in the US, so I didn't sign up. <laughs> so sad. But anyway, when I started, it was more of like a, I was helping out with DevFest last year, as usual. And then I gave a talk at Talk Years about some gulp related thing. And then that was when Thomas was like, hey, I definitely want you for a talk for a talk CSS, for a CSS conference. Would you be interested? I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. And then after that, there, there wasn't any news for a while. And then probably be about 15 to 20 days before CSS Conf, I was like, hey, so do you still want that, that conference slot? Uh, you have to let me know. I need to confirm. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. What do you want me to talk about? Because I have absolutely no idea what to talk about. Then he was like, hmm, all right, let's do SVG animations. So at that time, I, told, I, know, I knew nothing about SVG. And I only got 20 days to work it out. And I had 10 days to work on some dev stuff. And then so I had 10 days to prepare the speech and <laughs> create that whole thing. So that was then in 10 days. It was really stressful, but it was fun. So that was how it all started regarding the whole speaking thing. Chris? Um, longer story, and this is where I bag Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm from Perth in Australia, and, and so in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's from the planet furthest away from the bright center. Perth is that in, in the world. <laughs> you, you jump on a plane five hours to get anywhere and it's, it's not great. Um, there was a .NET community around um, and that's nice. I went along to one of them just to see what other people did and it was just so boring I never went back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, I've written C Sharp for um, like well over ten years anyway so I'm, I'm happy to abuse the language and love it at the same time. Um, I think around 2007 or 8, I started noticing that there were things happening in other parts of the world. Because always, you see the conferences going on and they'll just never near anywhere that you could get to. Um, and I managed to put a pitch in to my boss to go to Web Directions in Sydney. Um, and I've been to everyone since except for this year because I just changed jobs and couldn't get the plea in on time, it cost money and stuff. 
Um, so I started going to web directions and just attending <coughs> the conferences. I'd been doing training in-house um, at my work because no one knows how to write HTML. So it's like, well, this is HTML. And started doing all that stuff. You, you hire someone and then like, if you're hiring at any point, everyone can write HTML up until the point where you test it on them or test them on it. Um, so I started realizing that it's impossible to train or to hire anyone that actually knows anything about semantics or that kind of thing. So I trained them how to do that. I was lucky to have a boss who encouraged this. Um, so I had a like, basic CSS, um, JavaScript, and HTML training courses I used to give. Um, when I first went to Web Directions, I realized that what I'd learned at university about presenting was worth nothing. And <laughs> You know, every single slide I'd created up to that point was just like throw this lot out because this is just not how you present properly. Um, a couple of years after that, the inspiration kind of kicked in. It was, I don't know why, but I just wanted to present there. I didn't know how because I was from the wrong end of the world. Um, and this is like a conference that like really exciting people turn up to from all around the world. Like, why would they bother picking me? Um, and this is where um, one of the things they do with web directions is because Australia is full of not much. Um, <laughs> they, it's empty, there's nothing there. <laughs> if you flown over Australia, you can look out the window for hours and it's just dust. Um, John Alsop and uh, Maxine Sharon put together uh, What Do You Know and toured the country. They came to Perth. I was the only person who put a pitch in. <laughs> there I was really, really excited that they picked me, but I was in. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Andy Clark was along with them because he was touring around, and I was like, wow, there's Andy Clark, I've read your book. Um, from that, I was like, what I really started with is what to actually know that other people might want to know. Um, I worked for an insurance company up until a couple of months ago, 12 years I spent there in total. Uh, if you're an insurance, the thing that everyone hates is forms. And I set about making those right. Um, so from my five minute pitch at the what do you know at a pub, a couple of k's away from my house, I think about two months after my son was born. Um, the next year I was in Sydney giving that talk to um, people at Web Directions. And the worst thing is Mark Bolton was there, who's like the typograph typographic god. Uh, he was on at the same time as me, and I, I really wanted everyone to just go see him instead of me. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> From that, I got asked to speak at another conference, which was in Perth, so the commute was a lot easier. Um, got asked back at Web Directions the following year. Um, ended up at JSConf a couple of years ago. It was the first time I submitted anything, and it was the same talk I'd given, and it just kind of seems to keep happening. Um, I still don't know why I put myself through the torture, but um, yeah, I keep doing it. Nice. Excellent story. <laughs> Summary <laughs> per dad speaking, not so bad. That's <laughs> fine. And um, Rachel. Yeah, well, there, were, there weren't any web conferences back in the dark ages. Um, <laughs> so, but there were, so everyone in the UK used to go to South by Southwest in Austin in the States to go to the web conferences. Uh, I never went because my daughter was quite young. My daughter's 19 now, so I can do what I like. But back then, she was, she, she was too young for me to go off and leave her. So my husband went once to South by Southwest, but that was pretty much what all the UK web community did. Um, and I've been writing books since about 2001 was the first book I wrote, um, or part of the book. Um, as people would, once they started at the conference scene in the UK, which was quite late, it was something like 2005, 2006, People would ask me to speak and I'd say, oh no, I can't do that, I'm scared of speaking. And they'd ask me to get on planes and I'd say, no, I can't do that, I'm scared of planes. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't fly, I didn't speak. And, uh, and it kind of got to a point where I'm like, this is ridiculous. And so it was actually um, uh, John and Maxine were doing, uh, they took over a conference in the UK called Art Media. Um, and they came and did that and they asked me to speak and I eventually agreed that I would speak at that in the UK. Um, and did a very, very shaky presentation on CSS selectors, which I don't think there's any video of, which is good. Um, <laughs> but then having done it once and like not actually died, I thought this might be okay. Um, and so it kind of went from there. I then also decided, obviously, because I'm here, to get over my fear of aeroplanes. Um, <laughs> 
and yeah, I, I now have my British Airways gold status, and I'm very proud of that. Um, <laughs> it makes my life easier, anyway. Um, and I speak to about 30 events a year, um, and most of that comes from writing. I'm still a writer, first and foremost. <coughs> most of my talk ideas come from something I've written. Most of the out of the blue speaking requests I get are because I've written something. Um, and I keep saying that to people who want to get into speaking, write stuff. Uh, if you write something interesting on a topic that's, that's current, you can be pretty much guaranteed someone's going to be like, oh, that would be interesting to have on stage somewhere. Um, and it gives you something as well to, to point people to, like it's a meetup or something, say, so, well, I've written about this subject and I'm really into it, could I come and speak about it? And that's a really good way in. And it's certainly, before I had a lot of speaking to my name and people just kind of turn up and ask me to speak, that was kind of where it was coming from, was, was the writing. Um, and to say, it, it still often is, it's where I try things out, you know, I write things from a blog or somewhere and see what discussion it creates, and then I can think that might be a good topic. Yeah, so it's, it, it seems like most, um, what, cause, what, what, why I'm asking this leading question is, uh, okay, Chris and I always have trouble finding people coming to speak at Talk CSS. So well, my point is to, to let you all know that it's not it's not that scary, it's not that hard, you're not going to die, nobody's going to throw tomatoes at you, nobody <laughs> throws tomatoes at me, nobody's going to throw tomatoes at you. Can we just, does anyone have any tomatoes on them? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think what Rachel said was also very important in that you we really need to, you should like write and, and go and find out about things that are interesting to you because I think in, in this day and age we are we consume a lot, but we don't create that much. And and I think if, if we if all of us just created a, a little bit more, um, a lot of the knowledge can be spread around much faster. Yeah, so now I'm just gonna ask a question, each of them be just more specific. So I'm gonna start with Rachel. So what, what I wanna ask is, uh, because as I mentioned, right, you are, you are known, at least currently, as the CSS grid lady. Yes. So, so I guess my question is, of all the CSS topics around, why CSS grid? Uh, it goes back a long way. It goes back actually to the work I did with Dreamweaver. Um, I, I was invited onto the Web Sanders project years and years ago by Jeffrey Zeldin, this is like 2002, um, in order to work with Macromedia, who had Dreamweaver at the time, which was then bought by Adobe. But I worked with Macromedia um, to get Dreamweaver to output standards compliant code, and that's what we were doing. And while I was doing that, um, I got very interested in that kind of visual <coughs> representation of layout and how you could do that better in a tool. Uh, and kind of came to the conclusion that you couldn't, because, because of the way that floats and things work, it's very difficult to have a visual representation of that, that people can move things around. And I've always wanted that, and more ways for people to visually be able to play this stuff. So when I saw grid layout, it kind of made that connection to me that, well, here's a possibility actually where we could have uh, the ability for people to, to create layout in a more visual way if they wanted because the underlying tools are there or not, you know, or use, just use the code. But I think it's just that that kind of interested me and I wanted to play around with that idea. Um, so that was really where it came from. It's something that I've had in my mind for a long time. And, and also layout is, is such a huge challenge. If you're going to pick one, you might as well go for like some of <laughs> Excellent choice. Chris, I guess for, for you, I, I find that you tend to go towards like things uh, with accessibility, which is a lot less talked about here than in, say, the States. So why are you so particularly enamored? <laughs> or were you just strong-armed into it? Um, not really. Um, part of like, the things that I usually pick to write about or to speak about are things that I haven't seen anywhere else because it's like basic marketing, which I studied at university. How do you crease words something? <laughs> what, what can you bring to the market that no one else has done? Because I'm not Rachel Andrew, I'm not, like you guys are much more CSS, like Twitter followers than anywhere I'm ever gonna get near. Because um, most of my job is, I, I don't have time to write articles, I don't have time to prepare for conferences, because I'm trying to build stuff for a company Actually yep. working. Yes. <laughs> it's the cat photos. That's really what <laughs> Those cat photos don't get on the internet by themselves. Um, part of that's what happens. Um, something like accessibility, I know, is something that just doesn't get done enough. Um, it is something I care about enough to want to write, like to talk about at the conference. 
so you, you need to care about what you're saying. If you if you turn up at a conference and it's half-hearted, um, actually that's part of the inspiration of what got me speaking as uh, someone who I won't name spoke half-heartedly. They're not here, but yeah. Um, and I was, I was really disappointed because I've been looking forward to it. Um, but yeah, you find, find the things that you're doing. Um, I'm always trying to look at like professionalism in... I saw something the other day, how there's no professional body on the web and that's why it's so crazy. But um, it's something that you can strive for as an individual to become professional, to basically elevate your own standard of work such that everything that you're doing every day when you're there working for whatever bizarre cat pictures on the, the web company that you work for, um, striving to make it that bit better. So when you see that... Um, you know, there's a new performance goal that you can reach, like Google's one second of glass or something like that. Then you go back to your office and you're on web page test and you're coming in under five seconds but only just. That's your inspiration to get in there, change your company around and then speak about it or write about it and do something like that. So the, the things that I do are driven directly on what I've actually done myself. If I haven't spent way too much time on it, then I won't tell anyone else about it. <laughs> so if Basically, what I talk about are the things I think I do reasonably well. Um, if I don't talk about it, I'm probably terrible. <laughs> but accessibility in particular is um, writing a, a style guide and a framework for the company I was at, and it was like, well, why can't we just do this by default? And I found out why along the way. And if you're going to CSS Conf in a couple of days, you'll find out too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the things that I think that people should know and um, the weirdest thing I think is getting into what I talk about is usually not tech related. Most of my talks tend towards uh, psychology and UX stuff. Um, or for old people like me, uh, human computer interaction, uh, HCI. Um, yeah, I'm far more interested in that than anything else, actually connecting to the humanity behind things. You didn't learn that in school, did you? Um, I was considered studying psych. But never actually did. No. That, then that doesn't count. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thought about it. Okay. Well, Zell, um, you are the typography guy, so <laughs> why that? Well, I think. I don't know. <laughs> it just happened that way because, like, if I think about the things that I've written about in the last year or two, I was kind of known as the Suzy guy first. Then after that, I was known as one of the gulp guys. Then after that, the typography guy. Simply because I've written on them. And how it all started was very simply a blog post. And then I tweeted it out to people and then it got shared and then it got shared more. So, alright, this sounds interesting. So I'll dive, di I'll dive deeper into it and then I'll just read more about it. And the things that I've done so far are the things that somehow grabbed my interest along the way as I'm learning how to code. Like, grids was one of the first things that, um, that came up for me. Which was why all the float stuff, it was really hard to work on. That's why I got into Suzy. That's when I wrote about Suzy and that's when the whole thing spread it. Then for some reason, I decided to go into Gulp. I have no idea why, it's like a completely different route. And then I went to Gulp and then I got some JavaScript stuff related going. And then now I'm back into typography which is something that I originally intended to go into like four years ago. <laughs> because I, if you recall, I started out by saying I wanted to learn design. And, when th and the thing about design is that you, you kind of need to take, you, you kind of need to know typography, you know, to start creating that a design that is good enough. So I started wondering about, okay, now we have typography, we have probably some basic rules there that people use. And then we have like responsive design, how do we marry the two together? And that was actually how it all started. Then after that, I just got deeper into the whole thing. Like, I even got, I ever wrote an article for like CSS tricks, but it's still um, under review kind of thing, where I look at the design principles and then look at the typography principles and then how, how they all combine together and then where, where these things come from. So I go into very deep thoughts with myself, like I keep thinking to myself, probably I'm going mad because I think to myself so much that 
I go into like some really psychological things <coughs> once in a while, and then just come up and write about them. So my interests and topics just like swings 180 degrees, whatever I get into right now. So it just happens that way. Okay. Okay. I'm opening up questions to the floor. So go. Thanks, thanks. Literally, don't be shy, don't be shy, please. <laughs> All friends here. No, really? No, no questions? Come on. <laughs> that, for me. Yeah. You mentioned that you wrote a book, you started writing a book, and you started to. How did you get started on writing? How do you start again writing one? Do you start with a blog or do you write a book? Yeah, I mean that's, that's, I was just I was basically, as I was learning things, I was writing it down. That started really from day one. Um, I'd learn stuff and I was learning stuff from stuff that other people had written and so I thought, oh, well, I'll write down the things I'm learning. So I, I kind of started writing. As I say, when I left school at 16, so, you know, I'm not like someone with qualifications to do this other sort of stuff. I was just writing the things I was learning. and. That eventually got sort of seen, it got, it got noticed by Macromedia who asked me to write some stuff for them, which then got noticed by a publisher who asked me to write a couple of chapters of a book, which I thought was hilarious because like, I was this idiot with no qualifications. <laughs> so, <laughs> but something made me say yes, I've now written about, I've now contributed to or written the entirety of about 20 books. Um, and, and I love writing, it's how, it's how I work everything out. Um, but I've seen that happen to so many people. It's not just something that happened in the past. You know, a lot of people, it starts with writing blog posts and it starts with writing, you know, articles. Every, places are always looking for people to write for them. Um, and if you just write down what you're learning, and even if you're like a complete beginner and you're just starting to learn this stuff, often the things that you will understand and will be able to explain to someone else is going to be better than what I could do because I've got so much knowledge that I don't even know I've got at this point. Because I, I learned CSS from when CSS was a new thing. And so there's sort of layers upon layers upon layers of stuff that I just know. And someone new coming to it spots things that I don't see. And they're going to be better at explaining it to someone else who's new because it's different now. Uh, so, you know, I always say to people, just write down what you're learning and show the examples. And that's a really good place to start. I think, actually... Analysts can ask each other questions, too. So just going off that, I, I think the web industry is getting mature enough now that we're, like, music industry before us, mm -hmm. where the people who are inspired by the bands of the previous generation are, like, easily capable of doing as well or better than the previous ones. Like, if you're a Led Zeppelin cover band... Well, let's... OK. Um, Queen. Um, I'm a massive Queen fan. Uh, Muse are huge Queen fans. Um, they started off trying to basically write Queen songs on their own and didn't do very well and ended up being Muse instead. Uh, Coldplay, exactly the same. Um, they've basically gone beyond what the original thing was and turned into something else. And the web industry is the same as that. And that's why old people like Rachel and I can sit amongst people who are not so old and we can actually be impressed by each other's work. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I was speaking at a conference last year where I was chatting to another speaker, speaker dinner, and having a conversation, realised that he was the same school year as my daughter. And yet, which made me feel very old, but all of a sudden that was so cool. You know, that I was chatting to this person who was, as far as I was concerned, a peer, you know, we were having a conversation about technology. And it was only sort of you know, a sort of a side conversation that I realised that, oh yeah, you know, this guy's the same age as my daughter. You know, I could be his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and after I got over that, I just thought, well, that, that, is, that is so cool. There are very few industries where you could have, you know, two people with equal standing on a stage with that kind of age and experience difference and, and both of us be as relevant as, and as, as, you know, have as much to say. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. I, I like that. I like being part of that industry. I like being able to learn from, from new people. Um, and, and that be perfectly normal and okay. That's yeah. great. Oh, come on, you're up. We're doing things that you just stereotype. You can ask me pretty much anything at this point. I'm so jet lagged. It's like <laughs> <laughs> What's the chance? I've, I've got a broken bone in my foot and I'm on painkillers, so I. <laughs> Okay, so we have 
have this amazing jet lag. We have <laughs> drugged up. We have Zell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These guys are so uncreative. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's see what I can ask instead. Uh, well, I guess. Well, as you as you mentioned, the the, the web is a very unique industry in in the sense uh, that that that. It's, it's not like anything that we've ever had before, but um, this maybe is not so pertaining to CSS uh, exactly. But uh, do you do you think that the the web has like it's managed to give access to so many people, but it also sorts of lets a, a lot of you end up having a lot of people. Uh, doing things that they would otherwise not do uh, had they met face to face. So, so I don't know. Where do you see the web going? As I mean, I was seven when 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 you guys started using the internet, and um, but I I, <laughs> I, I I remember I remember the, I I actually find the dial tone the. That, that that dial up modem tone very comforting. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the short span of twenty years, the, the internet has moved so fast. So where where do you think that that where do you think where do you see this going? Do you, do you think that we've reached a, a, a tipping point that we're moving so fast that that that, that something's gonna give, or or you think you'll just people work things out, normalize, you know, people go up. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I, yeah, it has changed massively. There, there are certain things that haven't changed a huge amount. I mean, the fact that the sort of basic languages that we need to learn actually aren't that difficult. You can still build a website very simply if you want to. That's still all there. The, the core languages are still relatively simple. I hope they stay that way. I hope there's always the ease of access into starting to do this stuff. And it doesn't get so complicated that it puts people off just playing around and building a terrible website. Uh, because I think everyone needs to start by building a terrible website and then working out how to make that better and then how to improve their process. Um, there's interesting things that have changed. When I started, no one knew what anyone looked like. And for several years, the web wasn't images and video. And so, in fact, a lot of the time, people didn't know if someone was male or female. No. I mean, I, I've always used just Rachel Andrew as, as my handle online from, you know, in, in Usenet and everything in the early days. <coughs> But a lot of women used sort of non-gender specific names, um, and so you didn't really you didn't know anything about people other than this sort of little nickname they'd picked themselves. Um, we'd go to meetups; it would be the first time we'd seen people that we'd been talking to for three or four years. No pictures, nothing. So that's changed a huge amount. That actually you can come along to something and be like, oh yeah, I know who that. You know, people spot me. I've got red hair. I'm tall. It's like you know. But then I, I, I use a picture online that looks generally fairly like me. Um, and so, you know, there's that, there's a familiarity which has changed a lot. Um, and how that's going to change is we've got more, you know, I mean, things even like virtual reality and things, and actually being able to see and engage with people as people a lot more across the internet will, will I think, make a difference. Emily, I'm thinking where there's only photos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you're just going off looks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was there a technology that any of you encountered that at first really rubbed you the wrong way when you heard about it that you now like? Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, for me, it, 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 you don't have to talk about technology for me, like, like code rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, like, it can be as simple as like a CSS property. It's just not even like a CSS property or anything. It's just basically coding rubbed me the wrong way, which is why, <laughs> which is why I took so long before I started learning to code. So I didn't really talk about it earlier, but I actually spent six years in limbo, feeling that I'm useless and and uh, I don't have any skills while trying to start something. So going around like with a business degree that doesn't do anything. So. I thought we can. <laughs> <laughs> that six years was horrible. <laughs> but um, so initially, I didn't think I was able to code, and I didn't like to code because I just don't want to be identified as a coder. So it, it totally rubbed me the wrong way. Like code rubbed me the wrong way. 
but after I started, I'm like, hey, this isn't too bad. And <laughs> when I remember the time where I, I managed to replicate a website. So one of my first projects was to code this. I started, I started learning from like um, Touch Plus. So at that time, that website is still not responsive. Yeah. So I created a non-responsive Touch Plus website on the way back from Shanghai to Singapore on the plane, five hours. <laughs> so that was when that was when everything changed. Yeah. That was it. I seem to go the other way around. I always think I'm a late adopter to things, but then find out that I'm not, and then I'm, <laughs> then I'm completely surprised that no one else has worked it out. Um, I, I had this massive, massive fight to go mobile first. Um, what year are we? Uh, 2010. Um, was, my phone was kind of around. Um, and I was pushing, I was the head of the web department and it was like, we have to go mobile first now or we're going to be too late. And everyone else around me is like, on, maybe on a Blackberry or something like that. And it's like, well, no one's going to use these things for actual computing stuff. Um, yeah, I always seem to be on the wrong end of the curve, I think. Um, but as I've gotten older and probably a lot to do with parenthood where you just get so tired that you just watch things happen anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any, any technology thing that turns up, um, I'm just more patient with it now. That, like, for example, CSS modules when they first came in and inline styles with things like React and those kind of um, single page frameworks, and even single page frameworks to be honest. Um, when they first came out, I was like, well, you're doing it wrong. But let's just give it a couple of years and see what comes out of it. Um, let's CSS modules will probably be part of CSS at some point in the future because the core concept behind it is great. The execution is a bit weird and convoluted, maybe. Um, none of those authors are here tonight, which is good. Um, I know um, I know both of them actually. <laughs> I think they were here last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know them from going into the Sydney stuff. Um, but even with that, like everything will find its place in due course. Yeah, that, that's my old philosophical way of looking at things. Yeah, which reminds me, I hated Ben. Yeah, <laughs> I hated Ben, but I now, now I use Ben every single day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a question for Rachel. Um, because you're so involved with CSS grids, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of us don't really know how does something become a CSS specification. I think you could share a bit about that. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it depends. They come from various places. I mean, so CSS grid layout, um, the kind of what it looks like now really started with an implementation that Microsoft did in IE10. So CSS Grid layout actually really came from Microsoft, which surprises people. There's an early implementation of Grid in IE10 um, and, and following IE and Edge browsers. Uh, but that spec kind of drew on an earlier kind of working draft that had, that had come through the sort of standards process. I think it was Bert Boss had worked on it and things, which was to do with these sort of template areas. So there's there was other stuff already like, sort of kicking around in CSS. So things sometimes come from browser vendors or from other people who, who use CSS. That you get things that come like from the ebook world, for example, because they're all using CSS for ebook and things. You get stuff that comes directly out of the working group. So like the working group sees a need for something and so starts creating it. I mean, that's the common roots for things. You can also get, I mean, there's companies like Adobe, of, um, the CSS shape spec came from yeah. Adobe. That was their spec. Um, so they, they sort of all come in, but what happens these days is that typically a specification will then end up with the CSS working group, and it can't become what we call a, um, a WPC <coughs> recommendation without there being two different interoperable browser implementations of that spec. And this is to stop what used to happen in the past, where browsers did two like, entirely different things, and then we had to build two websites, one for Netscape, one for IE, which is what we were doing in the past. We don't want that happening anymore. So, so, for instance, Grid has just um, gone, gone to a candidate recommendation, and we've actually got two interoperable versions, because we've already got Firefox and Blink have implemented most of the Grid stuff. Um, but if it was a case of it had you know, only Firefox implemented, we'd have to wait for another implementation before it could carry on through the process. 
So what happens in the working group is you get these discussions between mainly browser representatives, um, and then there's a few of us sort of invited experts who aren't um, tied to anyone, so myself, there's Leah Vroom who's speaking at, at the conference. Um, so we're, we're just invited experts, so we're kind of not affiliated to anyone, so we can just throw spanners into as many works as we like. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of see myself, my role as being the kind of voice of regular web developers at the working group. So when they say, oh, well, what, what do people actually want out of this? You know, I can, I can say, well, I've spoken to people at conferences, and I know that this is a, a use case they've got. So that's, so it, it's a big discussion. Um, what I would say is there are very few people actually contributing to that work, and anyone can contribute to that work. The whole standards process is open. All of the issues for the CSS Working Group are now on GitHub, so you can go and look at them. You can raise your own. If you find a spec that is doing something crazy, and you think you've got a better use case, or you've got something that would improve it, you can add an issue. Um, and, and so that process is open and, and anyone can be involved with it. And another way to kind of influence how things happen is just to write about how you would use the technology. If you find, if you look at CSS Grid and say, I don't understand why the working group haven't done this with it, write about it, let us know. Um, you know, in, in the, we have this weekly phone call and frequently people say, well, what do authors, what do web developers think about whatever we're talking about? And we'll just be on Google looking, looking for what people have written about that thing. Um, so if you're writing about it, that's going to turn up and that helps to influence what we're doing. So, you know, it's actually quite straightforward to get involved with standards. Um, and it's been a huge driver for my career, my involvement with standards, sort of from the Web Standards Project onwards. Um, and it's quite fun. It's interesting to, to find out what's going on in CSS. So from a specification, which is essentially before, how, how does the specification get into the browser. So the are they actual browser engineers that are on the CSS working group? They they and they are the ones who say, hey this, this use case is uh, feasible and oh this we, we can't possibly do this. Is that is that how it works or there's it, there's a whole range of things. I mean sometimes things come from a browser vendor so they want to implement it and they want to then get it through the process so other people will then implement. Um, but you also get stuff that's developed in the working group and then kind of the best way to get it into browsers then, if it's not in browsers, is like for us to start making a noise and saying, we want this, we want this. You know, if you want like shapes to be in edge, go and vote it up on their user voice, you know, because that's how they know what we want. Um, and, you know, you'll see, you'll see are, there, are there any signals from the community? And again, if people aren't writing about it and talking about it and speaking about it at conferences, the browser vendors are like, well, no one cares about this thing. You know, this is just some, something that the other browser vendor likes to look up, you know? So it's, it's worth, if you see something that's only in one browser, don't think, oh, well, that's only in one browser, I can't use it, it's not interesting, I'll put it on the shelf, because that might mean it never gets implemented. Mm -hmm. At least build some examples, talk about it, write about it, um, enough that you see, yeah, there are people wanting this thing, and it'll, it'll be a, a good thing, because, you know, all the browsers, they, they want good publicity for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So if, if they ship things we like, we all go, yay, yay, we love Maggie, <laughs> we, love, we love Microsoft, we did this, you know. Here's a treat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but there is that, you know, they all want to do things that are going to look good, and they also don't want to be left behind if other browser vendors are doing something cool. I mean, like, the, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the whole, the, the, the grid thing, you know, the fact that, we're, that when grid lands, it's going to be, you know, interoperable in, in sort of the major browsers is, is you know, that's, that's really cool, and it hasn't really happened before. So, um, yeah, and, you know, to get involved with this stuff and talk about it, it's important. Is the much timeline for grid next year? Yeah, it looks it looks like grid is going to be unflagged in Mozilla and in Chrome um, to sort the of end of March next year. They've both pushed their intent to ship, so that looks like that's going to happen. I've been working with it for over four years now, so it'd be nice to see it. Source <laughs> 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 awesome of information that we can possibly have. <laughs> So the good thing is it's in the Safari nightly as well. Yes, it's yeah. Which yeah. always gives us hope with yes. Safari. I, I I think it probably will. So basically the, the work on grid interestingly was done by an open source consultancy, Egalia, who are lovely. Um, paid for by Bloomberg. So that, that that implementation in Blink and WebKit was essentially sponsored by Bloomberg, who obviously have use for it. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, but apparently they're a huge employer of jobs for developers. Um uh, do all loads of loads of front end stuff. So but they're sponsoring all kinds of things in the spec, which is pretty neat. Yeah, I find some of the most complex layout things that are in news organisations yes. yeah. 
because they have to have deal to with have it, yeah. Exactly. And grid solves so many problems. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can see why it's useful to Bloomberg, but I think yeah. it's pretty cool that rather than investing their money in some crazy JavaScript framework to do yeah. this stuff, they've actually put the money into standards-based development and browser development, which I think is really cool. The problem that I have is on the edge cases and things that... <laughs> 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 I have problems with doors as well. Um, you, you get edge cases of things that aren't as loved. I've got a uh, Mozilla bug that's been around since 2002. Um, I've given up. This just, it's just not going to happen. Um, they don't even care enough. Occasionally a, an engineer will look at it and say, yeah, we've written a test case and it seems to be working and it just never gets anywhere. Um, and then uh, another one I ran into last year was, well, um, this is the behaviour that's happening in Blink, so we're not even going to touch it because that's what they're doing. And then the response from the um, Blink developers, well, it's that way in Firefox and in Edge, so we're not going to touch it. Right? Yeah, and yeah. basically no one actually wanted to do anything about it. Like They could see that there was a bug, but there just wasn't enough interest in it. Yeah, there, and there are things, and there's, there's also things that where the CSS Wing group hasn't really, you know, because CSS didn't, wasn't really very well specified. If you look back at, like, you know, CSS2, um, a lot of things were really left down to interpretation. And so when that happens, browsers just interpret them differently. Yeah. That isn't so much happening now with, with the newer specs. You know, things are much more hammered out than, than they were. And, yeah, that's, that's obviously much better. And I think things being developed behind browser flags helps with that because you can have something which no one's putting into production. And if it doesn't work, it's, it, you know, like with Grid, I mean, massive chunks of Grid changed over the last four years and the only person's code that broke was mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at, at one point, you know, you're sort of, sort of like chatting, chat thing, oh, that's changed, hasn't it? And like, oh yeah, I'm like, best update your 20 examples. But it, like, it was just me. Because that's the nice thing about things to be behind flags is that yeah. you can make massive changes to naming and things when you realise things don't make sense, it doesn't break any code. If you compare Grid to Flexbox, yeah. and we know that like with Flexbox, we ended up with three versions of Flexbox, and that was because people were pushing you know, the, the vendor prefix stuff to production, and browsers were implementing against a version of the spec, and then the spec changed, and then those browsers were shipped and they were out there with, with that. So that's why really things have moved to being behind flags rather than using vendor prefixes because vendor prefix stuff gets out into production and then we end up with three versions of major specs and that's not great. And the great thing out of all of this is things like modernizer are not going to be required anymore. Yeah. Um, so you've got CSS supports, which I'm using in Angular now to <laughs> use queries. my grid code. Yeah. Feature, feature queries are fantastic. Yeah. Everyone um, should be using feature queries. And auto prefixer won't be required because... Well, there's no need for vendor prefixes anymore. No. Yeah, exactly. So we're actually reaching that golden age, finally, where things will work. It's awesome. Yeah, if you're using a lot of vendor prefixes in your code, check that you need to be, because they really are going away. Well, it's yeah. the fun of auto prefixer where it just straight, does yeah. it for you. You're losing them. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. You can check on um, well, can I use as well. To see what I, I wonder how long, though, people will have auto prefixer basically doing nothing. Like for years, because <laughs> no one will have any browsers. It will be prefixes. for a long time be, until, yeah. until Flexbox goes away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's the, the, yeah, the old, the old the IEs sat yeah. there, which are going to be. be I, it's amazing the things. I mean, having done this for a long time, it's amazing the stuff that you have littering your code. Um, that is just like it, it's sort of like I don't know, embedded shrapnel from the browser wars or something. Mm. It's like this sort of stuff <laughs> that's just kind of like lying around because you thought you had to do that. <laughs> um, I mean, like the, the number of empty divs that I would put, or like just empty wrappers I'd put around things to like apply padding to, so you didn't end up with weird around you. It's like, yeah, the stuff you didn't, didn't need to do anymore for years. <laughs> okay, any more questions? You guys are the most fun. <laughs> okay, That's I it. guess maybe if you're Insult actually, the audience. Okay, if you're <laughs> actually, <laughs> please come, please come next time. <laughs> Okay, we are shy about it. Y'all can uh, always uh, approach um, all the panelists after and like talk among yourselves and stuff like that. Um, so uh, once again, uh, Chris and I would like to thank everybody for, for showing up and um, hopefully after this, this conversation, um, you guys will feel compelled to show up for CSSCon because <laughs> tickets are still available. We have a 20% promo code which is... 
Singapore CSS. That's 20% off. So please buy your ticket. Please show up. A lot of good, a lot of good talks there. Um, Sarah Dresner will be speaking yeah. in the audience. Hiding in the audience. You guys you didn't know she was here. <laughs> uh, Rachel Andrew obviously speaking. Uh, Chris speaking. So. Hui Jing is also speaking, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah so, so please support uh, CSS Corp because it's really the, um, it's the only, one of the only major uh, web development conferences that, are, that is in this region. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not counting Australia as part of Asia. Australia is Asia Pacific. No, so, honestly, Australia so, is just so, so yeah, much it, in its, it's own really, little yeah, space. Uh, it's really important that we show the organizers that this is a viable uh, event. This is something that um, support is growing for every year. So so that maybe we can have um, more such events in maybe even other other countries other than Singapore. Personally, I like it here. <laughs> yeah. So so but you know uh, and and yeah. So buy your tickets and just hang around. So that, that that's it for us tonight. Uh, thank you all.